All right, thank you everybody. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm gonna ask some questions that we're gonna address in the talk. <clears throat> and I think it's fun to think about these questions because they would, they seem, when I, as we go through them, you're gonna say, wait, somebody did this in 1972 for sure. Because all this stuff <laughs> is old. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about how have CRCs been designed for use with convolutional codes and how should they be designed? Um, and um, there's somebody calling from conference, but I'm gonna just assume that it's not. Okay, so, um, so, um, hey, um, good to see you. Um, so there can't be anything here, right? CRCs were designed in the 60s before, it's gotta be done. All right, um, and then um, how should the concatenated convolution Convolutional and CRC code be decoded. Um, easy, right? You use the Viterbi algorithm and check the CRC. What else is there? Okay. Um, and how complex would this decoding be at practical operating points? And how does what we're going to talk about have, compare with like 5G polar codes or random coding union bounds? And then what does any of this have to do with BCH codes? Because BCH codes and convolutional codes are taught, well, when I went to Stanford, they were taught in separate classes. Probably neither is taught today, because there's no room in the curriculum with all the machine learning stuff that has to be taught. <laughs> and then, if we have time, I have a bonus round on incremental redundancy, um, which is very important in short block things. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so, um, okay, that was, and that's, thank you very much, that's the end of the talk. Um, <laughs> There was a problem. Here, okay. PowerPoint just closed. It just couldn't handle it. Okay. All right. So here we go again. So, um, we did all this already. Let's talk about um, literature on CRC design. Uh, here are some papers from uh, 1979, 1993. Uh, this is Koop, uh, Koopman and Chakravarti. Uh, there are a couple of papers by them that are pretty influential. They gave lists of CRCs and says, here you go, these are your CRCs. <clears throat> and most of the standards will use the CRCs out of Koopman and Chakravarti because who wants to waste their time designing a CRC? It's already been done. Or they might go to the previous standard and pull the CRC out of that standard and say, well, you know, this CRC stuff, it's got to be boring. It's already done. We're not going to waste our time. The thing is, all these papers design the CRC for a binary symmetric channel. And they are basically trying to make sure that they would detect a message that had more, more than a certain number of errors on the binary symmetric channel. It turns out that's not what you want to do if you're using a CRC with a code. So uh, there's this paper Chung Yu Lu wrote in, in 2015 that actually says, wait a second. What we need to do is design the, co the CRC to match the code that it is working with. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I, I want to, so this is Chung Yu. Um, and this is his paper, and let's take a look. I, I'm just going to show you this picture. And again, you know, you could have this picture is in papers that were probably written in 1950, um, maybe 1970 for sure. Um, but we're going to look at some just a little bit of equations around this idea. Okay, so you've got a CRC encoder, and typically the way this is done is so f of x. Oh, let's just I actually wrote all this stuff down. So let me f of x is the information polynomial. That's your message. Okay. Now, a typical, you know, if you read the instructions, how do you implement a CRC? They'll say, okay, well, let's promote f of x, multiply it by x to the m, and then we need it to be divisible by our CRC polynomial. P of x is the CRC polynomial. So you need to find the remainder that would make a polynomial that's divisible by P of x, okay? For the purposes of this talk, it's really much easier if we can agree, because this is, it's certainly without loss of generality, it's the same thing. Let's just say, instead of doing that, let's say our message polynomial is Q of X. 
and I'm going to multiply it by p of x to create my message. Okay, same thing, same set of code words. Um, it'll just make it easier to see the important thing about what's going to happen. Okay, so um, so norm, the remainder r of x would be added to x of m f of x so that this sum is equal to, it's divisible by p, which means I can write it as p of x times q of x. Good enough. Okay, so, and the convolutional encoder c of x then takes this as its input, and it creates the output, and really it's this product that's kind of like should start the juices flowing and get you excited. Um, this is why we're going to transmit. We're going to transmit p of x, q of x, c of x. Oh, so the convolutional code plus a CRC is a new convolutional code. Okay, so the transmitted sequence q of x, p of x, c of x is simply the message q of x multiplied by this convolutional code. Okay, this convolutional code, which can be expressed as a vector of, you know, because I wrote this bold, this is a vector. So this is C1 of x, the first polynomial in the convolutional code, and C2 of x. So this convolutional code is C1 of x, P of x, times C, and, and then the other polynomial is C2 of x, P of x. Of course, nobody would use such a convolutional code because it's catastrophic, because both of these polynomials are divisible by P of x. They share the common factor of P of x. So, you know, if you take the convolutional coding course, you'll learn that this is really stupid. You should never do this. I, I learned that. Um, 30 years ago in my convolutional <laughs> coding class, and I, I love the algebra. You yes. And I, and I taught it for another 20 years, um, and this analysis assumes, you know, it's, it's like in that physics class where it says assume a spherical cow. You know, like, like the first, this analysis starts out by saying assume an infinite length code word, okay? So it turns out those catastrophes, those infinite length code words, are not happening when I'm sending to 128 bits over a channel. That, that problem that we're so worried about doesn't exist, okay? So, turns out, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's catastrophic. Really, and this is the way you have to change the way you think about it, the concatenated code is an expurgated version of the original convolutional code, because you basically deny any message polynomials that don't pass your CRC, which means you're denying a certain set of convolutional code words. It can't be worse than the original convolutional code. So if your original convolutional code worked, with 64-bit you know, messages and 128-bit trends, then this is gonna work even better in terms of reliability or giving up some rate. It's just a question of how much better is it getting for the rate? And we're gonna find out it gets a lot better for a little bit of rate because if you choose the CRC to expurgate well, basically you pick the CRC that clears out all the nearest neighbors. Mm -hmm. That's killer, okay? That really does a good job and it does a much better job than the CRC that was designed for the binary symmetric channel, because in terms of expurgation, it's like picking a CRC at random. It has nothing to do with it, what you really wanted this code to do, okay? So um, it turns out there's only one CRC that was designed well, and that is the 8-bit CRC for 133171. You know, whoever, you know, for that 8-bit CRC, somebody just simulated the heck out of it and found a reasonable choice. But the rest of them are just not very good. So this is a plot of, undetected error probability versus CRC length for the, the, code, the CRCs from Koopman and Chakravarty for this, the most popular 64 state convolutional code, 133171, the one that Qualcomm built that chip for and you know, was in a lot of standards. Um, and I want you to notice the scale on undetected error. Each tick mark is five orders of magnitude in undetected error probability. And so for example, this, um, 5-bit CRC is giving up five orders of magnitude by using the CRC from Koopman and Chakravarty as opposed to designing the one that would actually expurgate out the nearest neighbors, okay? Um, the 8-bit one, it turns out, is pretty, it's not exactly right, but it's closer than all the rest of them because that 8-bit CRC was something a lot of people were using. I'm sure somebody, I'm sure they found that by actually simulating it. Um, so, so this is a way of looking at it in terms of undetected error probability using the CRCs that everybody uses versus actually designing it. And you'll notice, like, the ones that everybody's using, you get no improvement, and then a little bit, and then no improvement, whereas if you actually design it, what you expect happens. You <laughs> add another bit of CRC, your undetected error gets better, you know? So, so this is uh, an important, I think it's kind of neat, and, I, and so the, the, the actual thing is that nobody bothered to design the CRCs right before, okay? So, 
uh, here's another way of looking at that improvement in terms of if I want to have a 10 to the minus 25 undetected error probability. Um, by the way, all this stuff wouldn't have happened if Chung Yu didn't already have the framework in his research. Because when we learn about convolutional codes, there's this beautiful theory. Again, it's just so elegant and so beautiful to find an analytical expression for the bit error rate of the convolutional code. But it turns out, who cares about the bit error rate? We care about the frame error rate. And that, and when you do a little bit of extra work to get similar types of union bounds that have similar expressions, but for the frame error rate, and then once you do that, you can say, well, what happens to the frame error rate when I add the CRC? So all of this analysis, you can't do if you're thinking about bit error rate. You have to pick up lock length and think about the frame error rate. Okay, so, um, but in this case, you can see that in terms of bits, uh, you know, you, you can just use a required number of CRC bits. You know, basically, it's not that dramatic. You're going to cut your number of bits by a couple of bits to get uh, the 10 to the minus 25 versus one or the other. And of course, there are a couple of cases where it doesn't matter much. But um, oh, this is un annoying. Oh, OK. So that's not dead yet. Um, whatever happened? Oh, OK. Fine. OK. So uh, this is some work that you, uh, yes. So how did you find the best one? Like, um, or not? Uh, actually, we use uh, this. Uh, so that's what that paper by Chung Yu Liu is all about. Um, and basically, it's about you fix your block length and look over the um, find enough error that's like the block level that you understand um, what the. So for the convolutional code, you basically find all of the, the, the lower end of the distance spectrum and you find the convolutional, the CRC that clears it out the best. So it's, I guess. It's kind of exhaustive. I mean, it's exhaustive with a lot of intelligence about the structure, you know. But that's what we're doing. You, you, you basically it's sort of a sieve where you start discounting CRCs that don't get rid of nearby neighbors until you're down to one. It gives you the best possible distance vector. And it's and so um, uh, Ethan and who is where is Ethan now? Yeah, Ethan actually helped me out a lot with this stuff. And yes. Did you have a question? Are there nonlinear CRCs that would do a better job of clearing out? I don't know, but that's a great question. Okay. okay. We restricted ourselves to plain old garden variety cyclic codes. Okay. Um, but that's a great idea. You know, really, if you could start with, I want to clear out these error events, let's design a function that would do it. That's exciting. That's a really fun thing to think about. And that would, all the stuff we're going to talk about later would, would, then you could just pull that in. If you come up with something better, it will not affect all the rest of the stuff we're going to talk about. Okay, so um, so there are a couple of papers here where we do some examples. I wanted to show you a particular example because we took out um, the, look at the three GPP TS twenty five up to twelve. You know the, the fiscal air standard um, where they use this convolutional code and they tell you, okay, here's our eight bit CRC, twelve bit CRC, and sixteen bit CRC. And so I'm showing you this distance spectrum you would get by using those CRCs that have been in the standards forever and just designing one that actually gives you a good distance spectrum. And I just want to draw your attention to the, um, the yellow, the 16-bit CRC. So the standard, bits, the standard CRC has a distance spectrum that starts with 20. But it, another 16-bit CRC designed, taking into account its effect on the distance spectrum, has its first um, error at 26. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's still 16 bits. Why would you not do that? You know, that's the thing that you have to wonder about. Um, and this is how that affects undetected error performance for the 12 bits. Let's see, no, that's 16 bits. It's the green curves. And again, um, now each tick mark is an order of magnitude. So, you know, it's just a three orders of magnitude in uh, three or four, depending on, you know, uh, in undetected error that you can get just by using the right CRC. So you just got to wonder, why would we not do it this way? You know, um, so now I want to ask a different question. Like, wait a second, you know, Really, we're treating the CRC if the only is if the only thing it's good for is to tell us whether that original convolutional code got it right or not. But but everything I've said so far is like no 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 it's it's a whole new code. So why wouldn't we just decode the whole new code and get the full power of this new code? Okay, um, and so uh, oh oh I forgot to mention so uh, Ethan designed a whole bunch a whole table. So now for um, rate one half uh, convolutional codes, so this is sort of like a new thing that you might be interested in for all of the most popular uh, memory elements from three through 10 for the rate one half convolutional codes. 
we've given you the best distance optimal CRC so that you can use them instead of those ones that have nothing to do with your convolutional code that you'll pull out of other older papers. So, so use them. Um, so, uh, but the thing is, we actually know how to decode uh, a convolutional code and a CRC together. We've known for a long time. Um, uh, Shasabna and Sunberg wrote this paper, List Viterbi Decoding with Applications, and it talks about a CRC, um, but it kind of pretends the CRC is perfect and comes up with some arguments about that are kind of theoretical. And, and we're saying, wait a second, this is hugely practical. Now that I've got this convolutional code and this great CRC, I need to go back and do this list decoding again and think about, well, how does this compare with, for example, so I, what I want you to think about now is, let's say I've got 14 memory elements, so two to the 14 states, okay? So I can decode a two to the 14 state convolutional code with Viterbi, and NASA did that, they called it the BVD, the big Viterbi decoder, it was a big project, and then people say, oh, forget about it, we're gonna do turbo codes. Um, I can do that, or I can do a V equals seven convolutional code with a seven bit CRC, I still have a convolutional code with kind of two to the 14 states, but list decoding might have a vastly different decoding complexity. So let's explore, that's the thing that we are um, comparing. Keep that in mind, because it's kind of exciting. Okay, so, but I just, in case you're, uh, um, so, uh, so, oh, by the way, this paper I showed you before, I was saying they were designing CRCs, really, what Hung Jay and Ethan did is they dove deep into this list decoding approach. So we're not interested in what's our undetected error rate when we use this CRC with this convolutional code. We're interested in, we've got a whole new code here and maybe we can add another CRC if we want to do error detection, but we're not after error detection, we're after performance, actual frame error rate, okay? And how well can we do? And the reason why this complexity might it might be very different, okay, um, is, so this little picture here is what we're doing, okay? So the blue dots and the red dots are valid convolutional code words, okay? But the red dots are valid convolutional code words that also pass the CRC. And so if I've done a good job expurgating, I basically cleared out a lot of nearby points and I hopefully have something that is looking like this, like roughly equally spaced code words. Um, and now the black triangle is a received sense word that I have to decode. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna run plain old Viterbi and find the nearest code word. But then we check the CRC and it fails. Okay, so then I have to find the next nearest code word, check the CRC and it fails. Find the next code word, check the CRC and it fails. Find the next code word, check the CRC and it fails. So I just this is what we call serial list decoding. That's what, you know, Shoshabi and Sunberg told us to do 40 years ago. Um, so it's not a new thing, but the question that we have to answer, which they didn't think about, because it wasn't, is how many times do I have to do this before I get the right code word? And I want to think about it particularly at the SNR where I'm actually going to use this thing, okay? Because I'm not going to be decoding it you know, if I have a frame error rate of a half, then I'm gonna to switch to a different code. So it doesn't matter what the complexity is for the system where I'm not gonna use it. So it matters to me to think about what is the decoding complexity at the operating point. Okay, so um, this is what I'm showing you. This is expected list size. These curves are expected list size. The different colors have to do with different CRCs. Everything here is a V equals eight convolutional code, but I've got different CRCs. Okay, um, and what I want you to notice, this is, uh, I'm very interested in two different cases. There's the zero terminated, and then there is the um, tail byte, which we'll talk about more in a second. But for zero terminated, if my frame error rate is below 10 to the minus three, the expected list size is one. So I actually, I don't, I get this for free in a practical system. It doesn't cost me anything, because what's happening is I, I got, you can think about the original convolutional code by itself might have a frame error rate of 10 to the minus three. So that means it's fine one, you know, everything except for one in a thousand times. Only then do I have to go to my list and check more deeply. And by the way, going to that list is not nearly as complex as the original, the term. You've already calculated all the distances along the trellis. All you need to do is find the nearest detour, okay? So 
the additional complexity, the marginal complexity, after you've already done your first perturbing, is minimal. I mean, there's work to do, but um, Ethan actually did a great job of characterizing that complexity um, with equations and showing that it matches you know, the actual time on his laptop to do the list decoding. And so we'll talk about that a little bit, but the main point is your intuition is correct, that if the expected list size is small, the additional cost of list decoding is minimal. You do have to have the software on your chip to do it. You, know, you have to expend the slices on the FPGA to be able to do it, but you're not gonna do it very often, okay? Um, and so this is actually, uh, to me, thrilling. And this, this plot shows, this is complexity um, as computed by Ethan, which actually does match runtime for our implementations. Uh, and this is gap to the RCU bound. And um, in this case, we're not doing any puncturing. So our rates are changing as we're adding the C as we add the CRC, the rate is going down. But that's this is a fair plot because it's always the gap, the RCU that we're comparing against is also changing with the rate. And, and what's exciting is the very top curves are if I use a convolutional code with no CRC. Okay? And it sucks. I mean, you know, it's way too far from the random coding union bound to be exciting, um, except for if I get out here to um, v equals nine states, it starts to get interesting. But what's very exciting is that I add CRC bits, my complexity increases a little bit, but my gap to the union bound drops tremendously. And so the point is, if you're not using a convolutional code with a CRC and doing list decoding, and you're just using a plain old convolutional code by itself, you're working way too hard for the level of performance that you're getting. Um, so it's really, this should be the, the traditional, the starting place. This is the way to do it. In fact, um, list decoding, so what's funny is polar codes are so cool, okay? And there's such great theory about how asymptotically polar codes perform well. But at short block lengths, they don't work well at all, okay? And somebody really wanted to put polar codes in a standard and they tried all these different things and found out that list decoding and it's not serial, they have to do it in parallel because of the way polar codes use sequential cancellation. Um, with list decoding, you can get polar codes to work well. So that's great, polar codes with list decoding. But here's a little secret. Anything will work really well if you combine it with a CRC and list decoding. It just so happens, and if you do it through a convolutional code, you can do it serially, and the additional complexity of list decoding is super low. Okay, so, um, so, yes? How do you measure complexity? Well, we'll have to talk to Ethan, but basically there are three parts, okay? Complexity of the original, add, compare, select along the whole trellis, okay? And then you have to have the complexity. Each time I have to go to my list, I basically have to do a trace back and find the detour for the next best term on the list. And then there's additional complexity for keeping the list correct. So I have to do some insertions to maintain the list in the proper order. Is that right, Ethan? Okay, yeah, Ethan agrees. Okay, yes, sir. So that's gonna be the average complexity, right? Absolutely, your mileage may vary. Um, uh, for a particular code word, you might have to go to the list a thousand times. But you can certainly place a maximum and it turns out it will affect your frame rate, not at all. You know, I mean, reasonable maximums. So you can't, we can't put maximums on it. These plots don't do that. Um, or at least we don't admit that we did it. Yeah, okay, so, we, yeah, so you can have a very large maximum. But yeah, so these are, so, but the point is, um, we're operating within half a dB of the union bound here. With, and, and so the way you can think about this is, you know, here is where I'm hitting a half a dB from the union bound, and that is less complexity than the black X, and the black X is a V equals six convolutional code. So 64, with the complexity of doing a 64 state convolutional code, you can be a half a dB away from the random coding union bound, okay? Of course, this is average complexity, and you have to go to the trouble of adding the list decoding software which scares the heck out of a lot of people. Um, but luckily I was I'm fortunate enough to have Ethan come into my life who is willing to do that work and implement that <laughs> list decoding. So, um, so um, uh, but okay, so this is half a dB away from the random coding union bound, but these are terminated convolutional codes, zero terminated convolutional codes, and we gave up a lot in overhead with the tail bits to force it back to the zero state. We don't have to do that. Jack Wolf and Howard Ma told us 
that we can use PL lighting and get very similar performance without the terminating bits. And so this is list decoding for terminating. And here we are with our half a dB from the union, from the random coding union down. This is a uh, tail binding convolutional code with the CRC and list decoding. And now, you know, we're actually, you know, behind the random coding union down, which is the lower bound. It's okay to be here. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just really good. Okay. So basically what this means is, and these are, you know, this is V equals six with M equals 10. You know, a 10 bit CRC, 64 state convolutional code gets us within 0.25 dB of the random coding unit down. That's not very, comp you know, we can build things like that. You know, I would even suggest that that might even be lower complexity than running 20 iterations of an LDPC code that would never work at this short block length. Okay, so, um, all right. So um, here is uh, the random coding union bound is a dashed line. And these are our two, this is uh, rate one half, this is, Okay, so up until now, I haven't done any puncturing, so the rates are not, you know, the rates are all over the place because as I add the CRC, the rate's getting lower, the random coding union amount is different, but now we're actually gonna take the time, and I didn't show you that, but I, you know, Joachim Hagenauer taught us how to do periodic puncturing that preserves the good distance spectrum. So we're doing careful puncturing so that the rate is exactly one half. So think of it as a block code, K equals 64, N equals 128. And I wanted to do this example because my good friend, John Luigi Leva, um, and Bill Ryan, a lot of people that I know that are interested in um, short block encoding, wrote a paper where they basically tried everything um, for this case. And, I, and so I'm gonna show you their curves and our curves. But I'm gonna start out with our curves because we're killing it. And so um, <laughs> this is the real coding union bound, and this is a, a, a you know, 256 state convolutional code with a 10 bit CRC. We're basically on the real coding union bound, not quite, okay? But this is, a perfectly reasonable implementation. You know, you could put that in a cell phone, not a problem. I mean, it's much easier than decoding 32 different possible polar code solutions in a parallel list. Um, so, Did, didn't we establish it's not something to write home about that you are assuming the random coding union bound? Uh, well, here are the, um, so you can also achieve that with a convolutional code um, with, uh, the wraparound, the turbiata. This is a tail binding convolutional code with 14 states. So, and they are better, okay, by a tenth of a dB, maybe. So, uh, we have more work to do because this, I won't get into it. There, there are things that we're going to do to do make this better because the CRC here wasn't designed for tail binding, it was designed for terminating. So, we left something on the table. But, um, so this is two to the 14 states of complexity, and this is more like if you, let's say we add another state, this is two to the ninth state. So this is the BDD. So you can get the random coding union bound with a bare convolutional code, but the complexity is a lot higher, okay? So, um, and this is uh, actually, uh, when Bill Ryan was trying to do decoding with the CRC, uh, and that's just, well, it doesn't really matter, it's so far off the curve, but um, <laughs> this is, uh, so this is comparing with uh, 5G polar coding solutions. Okay, so this is um, the 5G curve with a uh, list size of 32 and the, and the uh, PC polar. Uh, so, so this is a list size of 32, but basically no CRC. And then these PC polars are like having a CRC. And these are for list sizes of eight and 32, okay? So, you know, it, again, you're getting there, but um, still not as good as just using a, a 256 state convolutional code with a 10 bit CRC. So, um, and then last, um, so now these are all the curves together. So this is everything that's in the, um, that paper by uh, Leva and Coxman and Ryan and uh, Fabian Steiner, you know, a whole bunch of people, um, all of their curves. And the one that's most interesting is, yes, if you have two of the 14 states and the tail binding convolutional code with wrap around the turbine, you're there, okay? But that's a lot, you know? And so there is, this is a lower complexity solution, okay? And then these are the, <clears throat> um, there are a lot of different lower rates for these short block lengths. These are the current polar coding um, solutions. Again, that um, uh, PC polar solution um, for uh, list sizes eight and 32. And now I'm gonna bring in our convolutional code and CRC solutions and they're better. Um, so, and basically we just went, you know, we can bring it further if you want by adding more CRC bits 
but we just stopped as soon as we were past where they were. See, because but our, it's very easy for us to make these curves better if you want to by adding, you know, nine, ten, eleven CRC things. Okay, so um, that's that story. Um, I have a question. Yes. So, so how does the convolutional code compare with the polar code in terms of complexity? It's a good question. I don't really have a good answer. We because in order to they're they're different enough algorithms. Um, that we need to um, team up. And we actually are talking with Alex Vardy, so hopefully we'll be able to do that in the next year to like have both things in the same computer and compare the complexity. What I do know, though, is that, um, if, that decoding a 256 state convolutional code and checking a CRC is something we all can do. Um, so I, I know that this complexity is not huge in an absolute sense. How it exactly compares to the polar coding Solution, I'm not sure. So I can't make a strong statement. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about VCH codes. Okay, so um, can we maximum likelihood decoding of VCH? Easy, hard. How would you do that? Burlicamp Massey, right? Burlicamp Massey is a hard decoding algorithm, it's not soft. Oh, I see. And it's bounded distance. Okay, so can I do soft maximum likelihood decoding, not bounded distance hard? So we're going from, the, you know, what we have. So all of these algorithms are Burlicant, Massey, Euclidean. These are all hard decoding algorithms. This is a list decoding algorithm for Reed Solomon codes, but it turns out it's also hard. It's algebraic, it's not soft. Okay, so the question is can I do soft maximum likelihood decoding of a BCH code? Okay, <clears throat> and can I do it in something that, in a way that's really easy? Okay, so. Um, and there, are, there is a way to do that. Um, so you can take any block code. This was like a cottage industry in like the, the mid 90s that any block code is actually, you can find its trellis. It may have the number of states that differs with the number of stages. It can be very complicated, but you can find the trellis, okay? Um, turns out for hybrid BCH codes, and actually we stopped our work on this solution until I got Alex Vardy on board and had him confirm that yes, it doesn't, doesn't really help. So high rate ECH codes, if you go into this world of find the, the best trellis, it doesn't get you much, okay? So the question remains open, um, how can we do soft maximum likelihood decoding of a BCH code in some, you know, with an easy algorithm that we really already know how to do, okay? So, um, and this is only binary. Uh, no, this would easily extend. You could do the same thing for Reed Solomon. What I'm about to say, you could use for anything. Um, so, the first thing I want to realize is, and this is the problem with these two things being taught in separate courses, so um, every BCH code is actually a rate one convolutional code. So, um, you know, you, you multiply polynomials, so I could, here's my input bits, here's the generator polynomial, so I can write a shift register like that and say, there's my BCH code. It's a convolutional code, it just only has, it's a strange beast, because all of the redundancy comes from the termination bits, right? So. If you tried to do tail biting on that, somehow it wouldn't work. So that's an interesting question. Like, why, why is, how come tail biting works for rate one half but not rate one? But there would be no redundancy if you did tail biting. So we're talking about a terminated convolutional code. Okay, so here's our trick. Um, <clears throat> all the BCH codes we're interested in, the generator polynomial is a product of a bunch of minimal polynomials. So you look at that product and you declare some of those. Um, composite polynomials to be the, the convolutional code. And you declare the other ones to be the CRC. And you do list decoding. Now your complexity is dominated by however many states are in the convolutional code. Okay? And so this allows us to go, so here's, we're doing some examples here, and we can, easy examples, so we have basically two minimal polynomials, and we'll just arbitrarily call this this convolutional code, and this the CRC, um, and these are all delta equals five, um, BCH codes, and um, so here's a simulation result. So, so first of all, um, this is hard bounded distance decoding, and we didn't actually implement Burlicamp Massey. You can do, you know, the binomial uh, expression will tell you, you know, what's the probability you exceed that. And so I, I thought, oh, we're going to do maximum likelihood. We'll do so much better than bounded distance. It's not true. Um, you know, it turns out the probability that you're going to exceed that bounded distance is so small that the maximum likelihood hard decoding is pretty much the same performance 
as Berlin Kit Massey would have been. So there's no real gain there. But what is cool is that now I can take, you know, the, the noise metric off of the Gaussian channel and get a soft decoding of that same BCH code and get, you know, pick up those couple of dB of performance that were just not available before. And the thing that I'm doing is not hard. It is a Viterbi on a relatively low complexity trellis. Um, now this is, it has its limitations. You know, once we get too many polynomials, of course it's gonna get too complicated. But, but there is a, a certain group of interesting BCH codes that can be decoded this way that allows you to do soft decoding. And again, what's the complexity? Well, we're not interested in how complex it is here. If you go, by the way, if you run it in these really noisy places, then there's no benefit. Because basically, you're never gonna find, you're, you're gonna find a, first of all, you're gonna find a random code word that checks the CRC, and you're gonna find it in a number of times that's equal, that brings your complexity back up to the original trellis. But if you're operating where you actually can use the code for some reasonable communication, then the expected list size is about one, and the price that you pay is almost nothing, on the average. Okay, and so this is expected list size for this simulation. Um, and we also have an equation that really predicts this well, so you don't have to run a simulation to find out. We can predict ahead of time. You know, you tell me where your operating point is, and we can figure out how big a CRC we can get away with. As you make the CRC bigger, then this is gonna march out higher, okay? But we can design it to, to operate with very low complexity at your operating point. Okay, so that's that story. We have to be really on time, yeah. Um, so, um, and then this is, so I had Alex Vardy go ahead and find the best high rate trellises. So this is, if you just take the natural trellis and just create the, the trellis created by the generator polynomial. Now, if you work really hard and do everything that Alex knows to find the best trellis, you can reduce your complexity by this much. But our complexity, as measured using Ethan's equations and our simulations, um, is the green line. And so and basically, um, uh, it's a lot less. Uh, these are, you know, it's a logarithmic scale, so there's a couple of orders of magnitude there. Generally speaking, you know, if you've got a, a you're basically going to get a square root improvement in complexity if you have the same size convolutional code and CRC. But we, we also have seen good results of having the CRC be two polynomials of the same degree as the one convolutional code, in which case you get, you know, a, a cube root benefit in complexity because basically all those states just go away um, because most of the time, you know, when you run the convolutional code, you land on the right code word and you lock it back. <clears throat> okay, so, um, yeah, so the complexity reduction, basically, you, it's, you go from two to the degree of the cyclic code to two to the degree of the convolutional code. You know, with some assumption. You know, if you operate in a really noisy environment or you've got too complicated a CRC, that's not true. But for a lot of interesting cases, there's a real benefit here. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> So let's summarize the answers to the questions I brought up before. CRC should be designed to expurgate the original code to optimize the distance spectrum of the overall concatenated code. Um, serialistic coding, which is easy for convolutional codes, in other words, the marginal complexity of getting the second item off the list is pretty minimal because all the, all the information you put in the trellis, you just leave it there and find a detour. Um, so, um, at typical operating points, the expected list size is close to one, and complexity is similar to the turby on the trellis of the convolutional part. Um, this approach beats the 5G codes in terms of performance, but I can't say anything conclusive about complexity. Um, and um, BCH codes can be represented as rate one convolutional codes with CRCs, and then you can decompose them to get a, a similar uh, low complexity approach for maximum likelihood decoding of BCH codes. Okay. So now it, we're in the bonus round. So we have about um, 15 minutes to tell you a little bit about um, incremental redundancy because <clears throat> um, actually achieving the best possible performance of a fixed length code without feedback at short block lengths is not good enough to approach capacity at short block lengths. You know, we know Shannon told us, uh, well, so, Incremental redundancy controlled by feedback doesn't increase the capacity, okay? Um, but it does change dramatically the average block length at which you can approach capacity, okay? And in practice, uh, this is the part that I'm interested in, in practice you can do this. You can get this benefit 
with a small number of x. Well, small is relative, but not infinite. Like the, the, a lot of the theory we're going to look at starts from infinity. Okay, so, and then the last thing, if we have time, I'm going to show you how you can use incremental redundancy without feedback, which sounds like it would be impossible. Okay, so um, let's see how quickly we can go. He does Claude, um, and in this paper on the zero error capacity of the noise channel, he showed that um, feedback does not change the capacity of the channel. Okay, so it's boring. It doesn't give you anything. But it can reduce the average block length in theory. Um, and in particular, <clears throat> we're going to look at this line now. For random codes with act and feedback after every symbol. Okay, so this was relatively recent work by Yuri Polyansky. Um, here we are, Polyansky, poor, Purdue. We'll call it PPV. Okay, so this PPV resolve feedback in the non-asymptotic regime um, gave us well, just to tell you what we're saying here, so I'm just, I've got my message W, I send a single symbol over the channel, I try to decode that single symbol, it doesn't make much sense, if I have 100 bits, I send one bit, try to decode, surprise, it doesn't work. Um, so, but in this model, I'm just gonna send one symbol at a time, and I try to decode after every symbol. We're never gonna build this system, but it's fun to think about. Um, and then, finally, you know, I send that J symbol, and I get an act, Whew, thank God. Okay, so after I get the act, um, then I'll stop the coding. Okay, so um, what Yuri showed is that here's a random coding unit down, and this is the random coding unit down that I was comparing myself against to show you how good these convolutional codes were, and it got up to this now. But so what? Because capacity is way up here at the short block lengths that we want to operate at, okay? So um, Yuri showed that with just that net feedback, I can travel a good bit of distance towards um, achieving capacity at short block lengths, but, um, and in fact, um, so this is no feedback, and this is only, I want to distinguish here, the only feedback that we're allowed to send is to tell the transmitter whether to stop or not. The coding has already been determined ahead of time. So this isn't anything fancy, okay? Um, but the thing that I don't like about it is the feedback is happening after every bit. By the way, these plots are for a frame error rate of 10 to the minus three. All plots like this have a frame error rate, okay? It's not zero frame error rate. Okay, so. Is um, this a zero error function? No, it's a frame error rate of 10 to the minus three. That's what I'm saying, it's not zero error probability. Okay, capacity is what I can do with zero error probability, but this curve assumes that I'm willing to tolerate the frame error rate. Okay, so, um, so this is within 0.27 dB of the Shannon limit. And then um, my, my student Kazura, a few years ago, using short block length, non-linear LDPC codes, like pulling out the kitchen sink in terms of complexity, um, we were able to, basically show that, yeah, you can do this, and not even with uh, transmitting acts after every symbol, but doing something else, and I'm gonna tell you about that. So that's kind of neat, um, and we have not, what we haven't done, and I'm excited to do, is take the approaches I'm gonna tell you about and bring in these new convolutional codes with CRCs and list decoding, which I think will allow us to get this kind of performance, but with much less complexity and start to feel like a real system. Um, <clears throat> so, is there feedback in this thing as well? Absolutely, feedback? there's feedback here. There has to be. If you're above this curve and you don't have feedback, you're lying. <laughs> uh, well, not quite. This is actually an achievable rate, so it's possible. But actually, I think this is a good this is a good guide of where you're going to be without feedback. Okay, and this is not a bad guide of where you're going to be, but we can be above it. These are both achievable curves. Okay. And what is the feedback loop at? Uh, at now. Here, in this, this implementation was ACNAC feedback, a non-linear, non-binary LDPC code. It's linear, but non-binary, okay. Um, but I just wanna mention briefly that I'm also interested from a theoretical point of view of what if I did have the full feedback, how much would it help? Um, and we've done, uh, so that's uh, 1963 Horstein came out with a scheme that is so beautiful that it has to be right. Um, but he considered it asymptotically, you know, like where there's an infinite number of bits and you're using this scheme. Um, <clears throat> basically, it's a lot like arithmetic coding. You have a set of messages and you rearrange all the posterior, well, you don't rearrange anything, but you can think of it like arithmetic coding. You've got the messages on a little real estate on the unit interval and you draw a line at one half and you send a one if your true message is above the line and a zero if it's below or vice versa and, and you're, it's on a binary symmetric channel and that will definitely achieve proof that it achieved capacity. Um, if you don't like his proof, um, then you would use the more rigorous proof by Shaivitz and Fader who, that proved it in detail and 
um, generalized it beyond the binary symmetric channel to all of discrete memoryless channels. So they call it posterior matching. It's a very cool algorithm, but it, they did not analyze it for finite block length to get a curve like Polyansky had. So um, that's where uh, Nagshabar, Jogi, and Weaver came in, and they did, uh, they called the same algorithm, posterior matching, they called it active sequential hypothesis testing, because it is, um, and that's, they come from the hypothesis testing world, um, and they wrote a series of papers, and in one of those papers, um, they came up with, uh, actually, I think the equation is, no. Um, so, just to remind you what we're doing, we're going to transmit or choose a k-bit message, in this, and so in a message space of m equals 2 to the k, message hypotheses, the receiver initially estimates a uniform probability distribution, um, and you repeat the following steps that are going to appear below until you converge, and so you, you partition the space into two sets, so the probability is approximately 50-50, <clears throat> send a bit, and then update the posteriors until you have one message that, has, that is so likely that you're going to hit your frame error rate, and then you stop. Okay, so that's really simple. Um, and so, Nakshavar, Javidi, and Weaver said, we've got to have a bound like Polyansky's, and they came up with this equation, said, there, we've got our finite block length bound. But this constant is about 2,000, and so their finite block length bound is, we can't get any rate through the system. I mean, it's a bound, it is definitely a lower bound. You'll be able to do better than that with some system, but you'll be able to do better than that with any system. So that was frustrating. But I, when I saw her give the talk, right up until you know, we tried to plot the equations, like, wow, this is so neat. So we really wanted to have a bound. But this, she got this bound with Martingale theory that is pretty complicated. Um, you basically have to use uh, some, a theorem of Bernicev's that lets you take two Martingales, one for the communication phase and one for the confirmation phase, and use a special function to turn it into a new single martingale and analyze that martingale. And by choosing their special function, you end up with this constant, but the constant's not good. Okay, so um, we came up with a new bound in this paper, which is on archive. And here's our, uh, so, so actually, first thing we did is redid the martingale thing and got a better bound that actually isn't zero. You know, it's not 2,000, it's still this number. Now this number's like 19. It's better, but not good enough because it's not better than Polyansky. And so if you come up with a, a lower bound for a full feedback system that's not better than the lower bound for the system restricted at neck, you need to go back to the drawing board. So um, we did, we did, and we came up with another bound. Now this, this constant is, has many more letters, but is about one. So um, now that's better. And then, uh, by the way, just last week, my new student, Amal and me, came up with a new implementation of this. So the whole thing about all this stuff you come up with these bounds, but then when you think about actually implementing this, like, don't forget it, we're never gonna do that. Um, because I have to track two to the K messages, so as soon as you're beyond like 12 bits, it's like I've got two to the 12 messages, I'm computing new priors for all of them with every transmission. But, um, but Amal came up with a scheme where you don't have to do that, it's very clever. Um, we have a couple of theorems. The first theorem is that if you're sending K bits, you can send the first, if you're sending a K-bit message, you can send the first K transmissions without any feedback and still get exactly a 50-50 split, which shouldn't be that surprising. Um, but then after that, then you can divide up the world according to basically um, your received message and the handling distance away from the received message, and you have, only have to keep track of K plus one priors. And it, so basically, now we have a system that's low enough complexity that we can actually build it and implement it, and it's, it's a lot of fun and it performs just a little bit better than our bounds. So <clears throat> this is this is Polyansky's bound. So any full feedback system should do better than that. This is our new corollary to Nagshavar and Javidi. The original Nagshavar and Javidi with that concept that's like 2000, it's like here. So it's not interesting. I mean, it's it, the math is right, so it's a good, it's a valid expression, just doesn't tell us anything. Um, and then this is what Hungjae and I did, um, and we actually, it's, we're not nearly smart enough to do a Martingale analysis, so it uses a Markov chain analysis um, and something from Gallagher's book, Time of First Passage, with a little trick to solve this fallback problem. But, you know, so now we're very excited. This, this tells you that full feedback can't help a lot. And the thing that's interesting about that is, um, just like in Polyansky, well, we haven't gotten to that part yet. So the thing is, you could actually get a lot of, this, this real estate, we can get a lot of that back without killing ourselves, because this is one bit of feedback. You're never really gonna send one bit, okay? If you're bothering to send anything, you can send eight bits. And so the point is, I believe what's really interesting is what, you know, we're gonna talk about one of these things today, like this transmitting after every symbol is crazy, we're not really gonna do that, can we do less? And then, like, can I get some of this back 
by sending something, you know, instead of one bit. Because I'm not even going to, sending one bit is not real. I mean, it's too simple. You're going to have more. And so we want to grab some of that rate back so that, like, at 100 bits, I can be operating within 90% of capacity. That would be fun. Okay, so now, <clears throat> um, what about this um, crazy thing in polyansky that they're going to send feedback after every bit? I'm not really going to do that. So all that theory is just useless, right? So I mean, that's a cool stop feedback, right? Uh, I, I just, yeah, I'm, I stop feedback, agnet feedback, same thing. Yeah, but stop feedback, I can think of it. I just send one bit of feedback whenever I'm done recording, you know? I don't oh, know right, yes. Down, like every, um, uh, yes, you could, that's, that's true. Um, but also not the way, yes. So I first pointing out that <clears throat> I'm over emphasizing that, that you have to actually send, you can imagine a system where you don't send an act after every transmission, you just are streaming your bits until somebody tells you, okay, stop, right. okay. But, and that's true, I, I agree with that. But most real systems just don't work that way. You send a packet and you get it. That's the way that standards are built. And so I'm saying that coming at it from that point of view, the idea that we're gonna um, set up a system where I need to get some kind of response, or I need to know, oh, am I going to send the next bit or not, doesn't feel real to me, okay? So I want to, I would like, I'm, I'm questioning, like for the stop feedback, like let's, you can, if you want to think about it in the stop feedback framework, what would happen if instead of saying, well, I can send this transmission at any time, I say, I want to limit you, and there are only five instances in time where you're allowed to say stop. How does that change my capacity, okay? Um, because if I solve that problem, and I solve it with something that's interesting, then all of a sudden you can build a system that sends a packet, waits for an act, sends another packet, and you can actually do it, okay? And so that's what we're interested in, and, we're call and the question is, if I'm gonna do that, if I tell you you have five transmissions, how long should they be, okay? <clears throat> that, I think that's an, anybody who's building a hybrid ARQ actually has that problem to solve. Um, and maybe they solve it with simulation, maybe they pull a number out of their, you know, so, but, but this is a real problem if you're building a hybrid ARQ system. How long is my first transmission? How long is the second one, you know? Um, so we want to solve that problem, okay? So I'm putting K, I want to, the first thing I need to do is build a rate compatible encoder, and I have my initial transmission, and it has length L, and then I have these other transmissions, and they're length L1, L2, L8, okay? So um, the initial transmission, and these are the increments, okay? Um, so now, instead of sending one bit at a time, I send in the initial transmission, which, frankly, is certainly going to be larger if I have k bits. It'll be larger than k bits. We're going to send something that has a chance of decoding, okay? And then I try to decode it, and I'll fail, maybe. And if I fail, I send a NAC, and now I'll just send, uh, and now the, probably, the probability that the decoder declares success will call PAC, and the probability it doesn't is called PNAC, and those are the only things I care about. I don't care about whether it's right or not, because separately in the system, I've got, I built a system that if it says act, it'll be right within my, with a desired frame error rate, okay? And these two things are the only two things that can happen, and they add up to one, okay? So now, um, uh, I send L1, now I decode the whole cumulative block, I try it, and then I, luckily I got an act, so now I'm done. Okay, so now, um, <clears throat> Polyansky has increments of size one, will let an infinite of number of them happen, and that this is not in detail for this talk, but we're going to decide whether to act or not based on the accumulated information density. You know, did I get enough information according to a particular code word that it looks like I should have been able to decode? Okay, so how well can I do with a limited number of transmissions? Let's say five. Okay, so I had my student Adam Williamson work on this problem in a very real world setting. You know, we're going to do a very low convolutional code for short block lengths with decision feedback. Um, and so instead of, a, for our transmitter, it's a convolutional code, 64 states, binary input added by guessing this channel. We're gonna use tail binding because of these short block lengths, that overhead of the, the termination bits kills you. Um, and we're gonna only allow four at max, so five total transmissions, okay? And so I said, okay, you need to figure out how long these transmission lengths are. And, Adam, and the reason why we did five is because Adam did this with uh, brute force search. And he said, I can do five, it'll take about three weeks, I can't do six, okay? So we did an exhaustive search and found these links, and we got this curve. Um, with, and the key thing is this is exhaustive search, and it's really ugly, um, but here's how you do it. And, and you know, this is an achievable rate. We can do a little bit better here, and we run out of gas here because it's a convolutional code, and as the block, for, 
this convolutional code, by the time you get to that block, you've exhausted the distance for that particular convolutional code, the standard effect. We're not surprised that that was brought down. Okay, so, um, so we've got these increments, and, and actually I want to say that we're actually, the way we want to think about it, stop thinking about L, start thinking about cumulative block length, because that's the thing that really matters, what's the cumulative block length at each time. Um, so, and by the way, we are going to not, we're going to just stop after M transmissions, and it turns out, you know, once your block length is long enough, this is something lots of people know, in particular, you can read this paper by Heidemeyer and Solzhenin, once your block length is long enough, it's so rare that you're not going to be able to decode, that whether you stop there or go on, then it's not going to matter. Um, so, Hazra came in one day, because we were redoing all this, saying, let's see how much better we can do with a non-binary LDPC code. He had the same problem, that, that curve I showed you earlier, how to find what the transmission links are. He came in one day and said, oh, this is so easy. I've got it. It would take us a second. You can always do it, okay? And that, this is really exciting, and I'm gonna show you how to compute these transmission links. Solves your hybrid ARQ problems. So the title of the paper is Optimizing Transmission Links for Limited Feedback with a Non-Binary LDPC Example. The Non-Binary LDPC Example is that really cool curve I showed you earlier. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, we call it sequential differential optimization. Um, NF is our block length, okay? Um, it's the sum, well, this is the block length of summing from J equals one to F, <clears throat> um, those increments, and um, it's a random number. It depends on how many increments I needed to decode this particular block, okay? Um, so our rate is the expected value of information that we get through divided by the expected value of the block length, okay? And so that how much information do we get through? Well, we set k bits, and we get it through unless we knack or unless we make an undetected error, we can sub subtract these things up. But I'm gonna tell you that actually, you know, this is 10 to the minus six, and this is 10 to the minus 10. You know, so in engineering, there are two kinds of matter, right? Matter and doesn't matter, these don't matter. So really, um, the rate is k over the expected value of n. And so if I wanna maximize my rate, I wanna minimize the expected value of n. That's the whole problem, okay? And so, it what is the expected value of n? Well, it's this equation, but it, that equation is much more fun to look at with a picture. So this is a picture. And this picture is the, the PDF of rate um, as a function of, so this is the rate of first decoding, okay? So maybe you can decode at a rate of 0.8, or maybe need more, lower rate, lower rate, lower rate. So instead of thinking about it as blocking, think about it as rate, because it turns out that this curve is a Gaussian for, for real code. It just turns out to be a Gaussian, and that agrees with things that Paul Yancey says, the normal approximation. Um, so the expected value of n is, well, first of all, it's the first transmission link in one times the probability that I was able to decode with that rate or a higher rate. That's that green chunk right there. That's the wonderful green world where I decode the first time I send, okay? But if I fail, then I ask for an increment, What's the probability I decode with the increment? Well, I get a little slice, so this is a difference of two key functions, super easy to compute. Um, this is the probability I need that next increment, and then this increment, and this increment, and this increment, and then there's the really sad place, okay? <laughs> um, this part of the Gaussian where I bought the rate and got nothing through, okay? And so that also gets multiplied by NM. So NM shows up in two places. It shows up in one of these and there at the end. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, so let's take a derivative um, and solve, okay? But the problem is this doesn't work. So I take the derivative of n1, and I should solve for n1, right? But I can't solve for n1 because I need to know n2. Darn, this isn't gonna work after all. I guess I should give up. But then Kazrin did this really cool thing. Really neat. He said, well wait, what I'm gonna do is instead, I'm gonna fix n1, and I'm gonna solve for n2, okay? So n2, if I knew n1, I can just, Calculate into exactly, okay? And in fact, <clears throat> for all the values, I can solve for any nj in terms of the previous nj's. So this doesn't completely solve the problem, but it takes an infinite dimensional optimization problem and gives you one parameter, a little dial to turn. And that dial, you can solve with the Karshkin tucker conditions. Um, so here are our equations, the SDO equations, and for any value of n1, it gives you the entire sequence of proper block lengths, okay? Um, now this requires a differentiable PDF for PAC, but this is, this is from simulation, okay? So um, the, the stars are the simulation results and the red curve is the Gaussian approximation. So for the codes that we're interested in, we have a PDF, it's the Gaussian. Um, and um, so we have these equations, but then the question is, well, 
it gives you a solution for every possible value of n1. Which value of n1 should I use? Then you get this really cool curve. Okay, so, so this is n1, okay, and these are all the other block lengths, okay? But I'm only allowed five transmissions, okay? So let's suppose that I need a frame error rate of 10 to the minus 3. Well, to get a frame error rate of 10 to the minus 3 with this code, I need to have a block length of 165. So I wait and I, I follow this curve until the fifth block length kisses the block length that will give me the 10 to the minus 5, and I stop. And if I want a frame error rate of 10 to the minus 6, that's the blue line. So I go slightly longer, I change in 1 to be slightly longer, and all these guys change accordingly, and I get 10 to the minus 6. And this, when we did this, um, so remember, Adam spent three weeks getting the right five numbers for, our, for the case that we, so we already had like what we knew was the right answer. SDL gives us exactly the same answer. And, is, and the answer shows up on the screen almost before you press the button running the MATLAB routine. Um, so um, this is really cool, and then it lets me answer questions I couldn't answer with exhaustive search. Like, what if I wanted to do, um, had instead of five, I want to do 32? Uh, and I already knew infinity, because um, that's Polyansky's. Well, I, I can calculate infinity, and it turns out you, you never need infinity, you know? It's not that big of a number. It turns out that Gaussian, you know, it only has a meaty part in a little place, and you don't have to sample it every symbol to get the benefit, okay? In fact, um, so Polyansky has two papers. He wrote a paper in 2010 to get this curve, and he wrote a paper in 2011 to give you this curve. But using SVO, I can give you a curve for every value of n to fill these in. And it turns out that for this case, this 2 dB additive white Gaussian noise channel, if I have 16 transmissions, you'll never notice the difference between that and the infinite um, transmission result, okay? So I think this is kind of cool for designing hybrid ARQs. And I guess we don't have time, but you don't have to have feedback either. Um, that's why this paper by uh, Mansoor, Interframe Coding, gave the general framework and we solved that problem. Just to tell you that the one slide, you use many variable length codes in parallel, okay? <clears throat> I don't know which ones are going to need incremental redundancy, but I do know by ergodicity how much incremental redundancy I will need, okay? And so we send the highest rate part of every variable length code. Some of the variable length codes need increments. From ergodicity, I know how much, okay? And then we use basically uh, like a network coding solution. And what we did was actually solve, built a real system and solve the degree distributions. And and basically of a peeling decoder, a generalized peeling decoder that as you're decoding, every time one of your codes decodes, you peel off its increments, which unlocks new increments, which lets new variable length decoders decode. And so actually, so it turns out this is one of those related problems. So why can't we beat capacity with feedback? Because anything that you can do with ADMAC feedback I can build a system that'll do exactly that without the feedback. Um, and so the, if we are able to come up with a code that approaches capacity at short block length with a few rounds of feedback, by the way, this is constant increment feedback, but the nice thing about SDO is now I now know that for practical purposes, you have one long transmission and a bunch of short transmissions, which is what you thought. So um, you can use constant increments. And that constant increment solution, um, well, I guess what I'm saying is they're the same problem. So if I can solve the approaching capacity with feedback, I can also have another solution for long block length communication that allow, that admits a very simple parallel implementation where you can have a thousand short block length codes decoding in parallel with simple Viterbi decoding. And I think that architecturally could be interesting. And I, I've gone past my time. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs>
Yes, of course they're gonna be noisy feedback channels, but we're gonna send, I was talking about systems that are gonna send five or 10 single bit at NAC messages. And you would apply coding to that on the reverse channel. And if you can't reliably send a single bit uh, on the reverse channel 10 times, then I have no hope for you. You know, this is, so I feel like we're not, this is not a case where, um, you know, the Shannon posed the problem and said, look, I'm gonna give you noiseless feedback of everything and you still can't beat capacity. And so it was fine to give everything because you're trying to prove a negative, okay? But we're, now we're trying to build a real system and I'm saying, I didn't talk about coding the reverse bits because it's not interesting. I mean, of course we can send a single bit with a probability of error of 10 to the minus 10 on the reverse channel. So, um, so I think that it's not a real concern. Um, I'm assuming it's noiseless. We could do it again and give it an error rate and think about a code, but it wouldn't really change the, the essence of the result. So uh, one question that may be a little simple, but why can't I create an error vector for the PRP when I decode it in. So you're talking about list decoding required because you have to list, get the cycle through all the, the convolutional code, um, code words that may fail the PRP check. Yes. So why not just um, compute the error polynomial for the PRP and then take um, your, your uh, received code words um, and then from there create a list of all nearest PRP um, code words that were passed and then only check those instead of checking convolutional code code words that you know are gonna fail. I, I think that's a reasonable approach. I mean, I think that sounds like a hard decoding solution. Um, yeah, the list decoder is gonna check code words that are gonna fail. And maybe you could speed up that process by possibly the nearest neighbor is the one that's gonna pass based on the PRP um, yeah, um, I, I, think, I think that's a complementary approach. I mean, basically what we're doing is in that picture I showed you where, you know, we're, we're saying here is our received point in space. This is what we received. And I'm just gonna spiral out from it until I hit something that passes the CRC. Right. Um, I think you're saying that the way the CRC fails might indicate, um, but there are a lot of ways your PRC is the nearest neighbor, and you can compute the nearest neighbor to the PRP. I think, okay, I'm just gonna say, I think that's a complementary approach, and I would have to think about it. It sounds like it could be interesting. If you can, if you can avoid, if it's easier than spiraling out like in Euclidean space, then we should do it. Absolutely, it is nothing different. It's done. No, it's just a long block length code. Yes. I agree with you. Yeah. The only difference is that this long block length code has an inherent parallel parallel architecture for the decoder. Okay, so it if if I were able to come up so and it, as soon as you have a short block length code, a variable length code with feedback that approaches capacity as close as you want, you automatically have this other architecture. And why would that be interesting? Because that architecture naturally decomposes into a thousand separate circuits that are operating totally independently of each other with a little bit of light interconnection that does make it a long block length code, no doubt, um, of, of XORs. You know, you're passing some binary things, you're doing some XORs, passing some bits back, and you do that in between decoding cycles. Okay, so um, I think for like high throughput optical systems, right now like um, Frank Shishang has some solutions like staircase codes. So this would be a competing architecture. It's an architecture approach. You know, would it perform better in terms of frame error rate than a, an LDPC code of the same length? No, of course not. You know, um, it's just that architecturally it might provide a benefit. The input behind the yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for. Thank you.